So April 3rd, 33 AD, it was a crazy evening, let me tell you right now. It was a weird, weird night. You see, it started off, we had dinner with, with Jesus and all of the disciples. And it was a weird dinner, let me tell you, it was a weird, weird dinner. It started off, Jesus washed our feet. And then he talked about somebody was going to betray him, which was just crazy, crazy talk. And then he started teaching, and he started talking about how he was the vine and the branches, and how his body was bread, and his blood was wine. It was just, it was crazy. It was the weirdest dinner I have ever had in my entire life, let me tell you that. But then when dinner was over, we were, we were kind of glad dinner was over, because it was so weird. We went out, and we were going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is out on the Mount of Olives. And that's, and we went there a lot, so that was pretty normal. So as we left out of, the, out of the upper room, we went that way. And as we were on our way, Jesus kept teaching and he kept talking. And he said another weird thing, just the weird night continued. He said, before the end of the night, all of you will fall away from me. And we're like, what is he talking about? That's not going to happen. We've been following you for three years. And of course, it's Peter. Peter steps up and says, teacher, even if all of them leave you, I will still be here. Well, of course, you know, Peter's got to put his foot in his mouth because that's, that's how Peter is. So Jesus says, well, I tell you, Peter, before the end of the day, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Of course, Peter, that was just no way. That's not going to happen. You know, Peter, he was just, he was upset about that. He was for sure that wasn't going to happen. So we leave out of the upper room. We have to go out of the city to get to the Mount of Olives because it's outside of the city walls. Well, at that time, it was probably around 9, 10 o'clock that night we were heading out there. Well, the only gate that was open was the gate of Essenes, and we had to come around the entire city and we had to cross the Kidron Brook, which we did all the time, because we had to go, we had to cross that to get to the Mount of Olives. And normally that creek is running with water, but tonight it was running red. It was crazy. It was crazy. So we get to the garden, and Jesus says, you all stay here, and we're going to go pray. And he takes me and my brother John and Peter, and he takes us over a little further into the valley. And he, you could just tell in his face he was upset. Something was very wrong. And after him talking about us betraying him and us scattering and fleeing and Peter denying him, it kind of made sense a little bit. So Jesus took us a little further and he said, you all stay here and you all watch and you all pray. I'm going to go a little further. He said, my soul is very sorrowful. I need to pray. So he goes out and he goes and gets face down on the ground and starts praying as he always did. Well, he was gone forever. It seemed like he was gone. It was the longest he'd ever been gone in our books. And, you know, of course, by this time, it's around 11 o'clock at night, and we we're tired. And, you know, we're talking, trying to stay awake. And, and I don't know who, I think John was, yawned first. And then next thing you know, we were all yawning. And, and the next thing you know, we were all just sound asleep. Just could not keep our eyes open. Have you ever been in there where you can't keep your eyes open? Well, that's how we were. And, of course, we all fall asleep. Well, here comes Jesus, and he's waking us up. And he said, can you all not stay awake? for just a little bit while I go and pray? Can you not pray with me? And of course that made us feel bad. So he says, wake up and pray that you don't fall into temptation. And he goes on and goes to pray again. So this time we're not gonna fall asleep, we're good. Well then about 10 minutes later, all of us are asleep again because we can't keep our eyes open. And then here comes Jesus again, wake up, what are you all doing? Come on. So we wake up one more time and then he goes and prays. And of course the third time's a charm and we fall asleep again. So here comes Jesus for the third time after out praying and his soul is sorrowful and he's just, he's got just the weight of the world on him and he goes and he comes back and he says, all right, you all wake up. Don't you, you have time to sleep later basically. And he says, but behold, my betrayer's coming. Well, of course that woke us up like a splash of cold water. We thought, okay, we've been wanting to know who this betrayer was for the last six hours. Who is this one that's betraying? He says, behold, here he comes, let's go. So we get the four of us and we walk back to where the other disciples were and here comes a band of men. They've got torches and swords, um, and, and they're ready to fight. And we're like, what in the world is going on? Well, lo and behold, here comes Judas out of the middle of them, that backstabbing, mm, that backstabbing man. And here comes Judas, and he walks up to Jesus, and he gives Jesus a kiss right on the cheek. And the men seized Jesus, and they grabbed him, and they bound his hands behind his back. And, of course, Jesus is just standing there, He's totally fine with it all. Of course, that, you know, but we're upset. We don't know what's going on. We're ready to fight. And of course, here is Peter again. Peter pulls his sword out and just wildly swings it. And I'm sure he probably had his eyes closed. And he hit the, he hit the, the head chief, the, 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 uh, the chief priest of Israel, his servant, hit him in the ear with a sword and cut his ear clean off. It was disgusting. I'll be honest. But Jesus picks his ear up and puts it back on. And he says, you all quit that. 
He says, don't you think that I could pull down legions upon legions of angels to take these mere humans out? So Jesus allows them to lead them away and they go back towards the city. Well, we didn't know what to do. We were terrified. We, were, we didn't want to be arrested. We didn't want to you know, go with these men. So we scattered. We left. We got out of there. And, you know, some of us went up over the, the Mount of Olives to Bethany. Uh, some of us stayed around. Uh, Peter went back into the city uh, trying to stay close to Jesus as he could because you know, he said he wasn't going to deny Jesus or, or flee or fall away. But that night was crazy. It was a tragic, tragic night. I never felt so bad. And I wish that was the end of the night. I wish that was it. But it just got worse and worse and worse. Y'all, let's pray. And gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for, for the Bible. We're so thankful for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that we can look into your word and see what happened that last night, those last 24 hours of Jesus' life before he had to the cross. And I pray that you just be with us right now as we look deeper into your word. And I pray that we can pull out some major truths from that that we can apply to our lives on a daily basis. And please be with me right now. Remove me from this teaching time. Let it be completely about you and not about me whatsoever. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. Now, if you weren't here last week, you probably wondered why in the world I wore a, why in the world I had on a um, pinstripe toga or tunic, whatever that thing's called. I don't know. Anyway, uh, so last week we started a new series called 24. Um, where we're going to take the next five weeks and look at the, the last 24 hours of Jesus' life before he went to the cross. Last week, we looked at the upper room, and we talked about the upper room uh, conversation that he had with his disciples, with washing their feet, um, and the teaching that he gave to them, and instituting communion, um, and talking about the Lord's Supper, and how his body was the bread, and his blood was the wine. But um, today, what we're going to talk about is in the garden, if you, if you haven't figured that out. You see, for after the dinner was over, after the upper room, they, the, the disciples and Jesus left out of the upper room, and they went to the Mount of Olives into the Garden of Gethsemane. And once they got to the garden, Jesus prayed, and his disciples were there with him while he prayed. Now, the accounts that we have on that um, evening and in the garden are pretty much the same. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all pretty much the same. Actually, John just has a little itty bitty snippet. See, last week when we looked at the upper room, you know, John had five chapters on the upper room, whereas the, the rest of them only had a few verses here and there. Uh, so John's actually quieter on this than he is anywhere else. Um, so we're going to look into Mark 14, verse 32 through 52. And this is, what, this is what it says from the Word. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell onto the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible with you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you, not, can you, could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said, are you all still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chiefs, priests, and scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one that I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him and at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but linen cloth about his body. And they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Now, before we go any further, we need to talk about that last verse. 
I don't know what is going on here. Let's be honest. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. They seized him. He left the linen cloth and he ran away naked. Why in the world is that in there? You know what I mean? It's just crazy. Now, what most biblical scholars think is that this is Mark, that the, that the writer of this book is Mark, and this is him saying, yes, look, I was there. Now, why he ran away naked, why he said he ran away naked, I don't know. That's just, that's just crazy. But this, this furthers the point showing that all of his disciples were going to scatter and leave him, even if they were running away naked, which was just crazy at the time. Anyway, moving on. So we've got 20 verses from the book of Mark, 20 in Matthew, 14 in Luke, and like I said, 11 from John. Now, this makes sense because John, you know, he understood that they had a lot about the garden in there, and he didn't need to, you know, add more in, add more in. So Jesus enters into the garden. Now, see, when we read this in our 21st century mind, you know, what we do is we take events that happened in 33 AD, and we move them into 2016 AD. You know, when we read this, you know, they left out of the upper room and went to the garden. You know, when we read this and we think, you know, hey, they left, they came out of the house, they walked across the street, you know, they waited for traffic to pass, they walked across the street into the garden, and that's where they prayed. You know, we act like it's just, you know, a stone's throw. But that's actually not the case, you know. And here's another thing about it, is with this being Passover, it was Jewish custom for everyone, all of the Jews that did not live in the city, it was the custom for them to pilgrimage to Jerusalem for this day, for basically this weekend. So the city would have been full of people all the way to the top, okay? So, so here they are. They're leaving from the upper room and going to the garden. And like I said, the city is just packed. Now see, this is what's, this is what's going on here. Um, the Passover played into this situation so many ways, and we're looking at the fact that the influx of people, and the chief priests and scribes, they would not have arrested Jesus with all of these extra people in Jerusalem. You see, Jesus had a massive following. People loved being with Jesus. People loved seeing his miracles. I'm sure those were pretty cool. Um, they loved hearing his teaching because it was probably just mind-blowing crazy to them. And they also loved eating his uh, free food that he gave out. You know, if you feed them, they will come. So for this reason, the chiefs, the, the priests and the scribes, they're not going to arrest Jesus in the middle of the day in the temple. They have to go out and get him outside of the city and at night. See, Jesus went from, it, it, it says in, in throughout the Gospels that Jesus went far, as far south as Jerusalem and as far north as Tyre. So that's like a 115 mile span. So everyone would have known who Jesus was. So knowing that makes the garden scene make a little bit more sense and this post-midnight arrest make a little bit more sense. Now, another thing that we need to understand to get the full picture of what's going on in this garden scene, what's going on in this situation, is we have to understand the geography and the topography of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. See, we have to have an idea of where they're really going, where they started at and where they ended up. So before we explain like, where these places are and everything, watch this video real quick. This is a quick, easy video to show you uh, what's going on with Jerusalem. Sorry. Me is uh, the city of Jerusalem, and of course, biblically speaking, Jerusalem is the most important city in the world, and so we really want to take our time to understand it. And in order to begin to understand the city of Jerusalem and the history that happened there, we need to go back to the beginning, back to Genesis. And uh, a good place to start is Genesis chapter 22, verse 2, where the Lord instructs Abraham to take his son Isaac and go to the region of Moriah. So what is this region of Moriah? Well, first of all, it's located between two ridges, the Mount of Olives on the east and the Watershed Ridge on the west. Okay, so the region of Moriah is located between the Mount of Olives and the Watershed Ridge. It is made up of three major valleys. So from west to east, these valleys are the Ben Hinnom Valley, the Central Valley, and the Kidron Valley. Now the Ben Hinnom Valley makes up the western and southern borders of this region. The Kidron Valley makes up the eastern border of the region of Moriah. In between the Ben Hinnom and Kidron Valleys is the Central Valley, which divides two hills, the eastern hill from the western hill. Now at the time of Abraham, which is roughly 2000 BC, there is the city of Salem located on the lower part of the eastern hill, the southern part of the eastern hill. And the reason that its location is here is because there's also a spring of water located here. 
to the north of the city of Salem is the upper part of the eastern hill and it comes and forms a peak with a rocky outcropping and the Bible calls this Mount Moriah as it is still called today. West of Mount Moriah across the central valley is the higher western hill which also plays a major role in the history of Jerusalem. So we have this region of Moriah that is between the Mount of Olives and the Watershed Ridge made up of these three valleys, the Ben Hinnom, the Central, and the Kidron that define two hills, the Eastern Hill and the Western Hill. And together, this is the geography that from the time of Abraham on through the rest of the Bible becomes the city of Jerusalem. Okay, so, so there you go. So now you can see on there now of what's going on and where we are. Now, you're probably thinking, why in the world do we you know, really need to know that? Who, who really cares, honestly? But this, is, this plays a huge part into this garden discourse and what's really going on in the mind and in the soul of Jesus as he's coming into the garden. Now, obviously, this, this is what the um, Jerusalem would have looked like during the time of Abraham just the small city of Salem there at the southern part of the eastern hill. But um, shortly after that, the city expanded north. And as you can see we're, um, at, the, at the top there, that's where the Temple Mount is. And that is actually on Mount Moriah. That's where Abraham um, nearly sacrificed Isaac. That is where um, Solomon's temple was originally. And that is currently where the Dome of the Rock is. So that's where, that's where that is at the northernmost part of the city. Now, most cities, whenever they expand, they expand in all directions, you know, like, like, a, like a donut going out. But um, Jerusalem could not do that. Jerusalem, instead, they, um, when it expanded, it expanded to the west, so towards the, um, the western hill, which is the higher hill there. Now, that comes into play here during uh, Jesus' time, because by the time Jesus came um, in the first century, the city was expanded up onto that far western hill. So the city of Jerusalem at the time was split into two parts. It was the lower city and the upper city. Obviously, the lower city would be the, part, the original part of Salem and where the temple was, and then the upper city is up on that higher hill. So that's what's going on with, um, with the city of Jerusalem when Jesus comes. Now, the reason that the city had to expand to the west instead of out in all directions was because the Mount of Olives, which was just to the east, of Jerusalem, the main city of Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives was used for burial, okay? The Mount of Olives was full of tombstones and graves and, and tombs. This is, uh, this is a current day picture of the Mount of Olives. You can see, it's hard to see here, but all of those little white dots almost looks like trash on the side of the mountain. Those are all graves. Now, obviously, that is a, that's a current picture, but um, archaeologists and scholars believe that during the time of Jesus, there were over 150,000 tombs on the Mount of Olives. So whenever the city was expanding, they didn't want to expand out into the Mount of Olives because it was basically just a big graveyard, and they didn't want to put the city right there. So here, this is, this is where Jesus is going. Jesus is going to the Mount of Olives, which is basically a big burial ground. So, but there is a garden um, just right there, a walled-off garden full of olive trees, olive trees just at the base of the Mount of Olives right there. Now, back to Passover. We talked about Passover a minute ago. Now, as you could see, let me, let me switch back to this one here. The Kidron Valley was just to the east of Jerusalem. The Kidron Valley is the, one, is the valley that separates um, the city of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. So for the for Jesus and the disciples to get to the Mount of Olives, they would have had to cross that valley. Now, you're probably wondering, okay, so, so what? Who cares? Well, the Kidron Valley, at the very bottom of that, there was um, running water called the Kidron Brook. Um, and year-round it ran, except for the hot months of the summer, it didn't run. But see, the main thing is the, the Kidron Brook and the Kidron Valley was the main drainage system for the city of Jerusalem. So all of the sewage um, and, and nasty drain, drainage stuff came, coming out of the city would go into that brook. So it was a, obviously a very polluted brook and would have been pretty nasty. But see, here's the thing. With it being Passover, um, the, the population at the time of Jerusalem was around 600,000. But if you add in all of the people coming in for Passover, it was probably three times that. So you have over a million people, close to two million people, all needing to sacrifice a lamb that night. See, because the sacrifice of the lamb, the Passover, 
is in remembrance of in Exodus when God was bringing the Israelites from out of Egypt into the desert. And the very last plague of the plagues of Egypt was where God was going to send the angel of death to take out the firstborn son of all of the, um, of everyone. And the only way for the angel to pass over was if you had sheep's blood or lamb's blood over the um, door frame of the house. So that is where Passover comes from. So in memory of that and in honor of that, on the night of Passover, the Israelites would all sacrifice a lamb and take a little bit of blood and put it over their door frame. That way, it was a symbolic of, yes, we remember Passover. We remember what God did for us. So but if you take one, almost two million people that all need to sacrifice a lamb, and they just need two brushes worth of blood, well, the rest of that blood has to go somewhere, okay? Now, if you, if you look here, the, uh, you can see the Temple Mount is at the top. They would have sacrificed at the temple, and all of that extra blood would have ran out the city and down the Kidron Valley. So you're probably thinking, why in the world are we spending so much time? Why are we, why are we thinking about this? Um, but see, here's the thing. Jesus is leaving out of the city, and they, come, they had to come out the south because that's the only gate that's open and walk around the city. So to hear Jesus and his disciples are walking. Jesus knows what's about to happen to him. He knows he's about to be arrested. He knows he's about to be, have a brutal beating. He knows that he's about to have an excruciating death on the cross. So where's he going? He's walking to the garden. And to get to the garden, he has to cross a brook that's running red with the blood of the lambs. And as he's crossing this brook that's running with blood, he's crossing that and going into a graveyard that's full of tombs, knowing that in less than 24 hours, he himself is going to be in a tomb. So that kind of lets you know what's going on in Jesus' head right now. Now, of course, I'm sure this was probably all lost on the disciples. They probably thought it was just gross that blood was running through. They didn't even think about going into the garden because they had been there so many times. But I'm sure that the, that the symbolism and the irony was not lost on Jesus whatsoever. There's no wonder that the account of Mark says that Jesus' soul was sorrowful even to the point of death. Let's pick up the text in uh, Luke 22, verse 41. It says, he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. He knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So in these verses, we see the soul of Jesus. We see where Jesus' heart is at this moment. He is just in agony. It is just killing him what is about to happen to him. So today what we need to do is we need to stop and look at these verses and break them down and see exactly where Jesus is. You see, this count is full of glimpses into Jesus' character, where he was mentally and emotionally. And there are four main actions that Jesus took during this time in the garden that we need to look at. Now, the first of these actions is that Jesus was distressed. Now, if you're thinking, well, yeah, that's probably an understatement, you would be right. I mean, that is a no-dust statement. Yes, Jesus was upset. Jesus was distressed. Jesus said his soul was sorrowful. He was said to be in, in agony. Now, obviously, there's a great deal of sadness and grief um, and worry that comes with going through an unfair trial and a beating and dying on a cross. But was that all it was? Is that the only reason that Jesus was so upset? Was there a bigger reason? Is there more than just what's on the surface? Isaiah 53, 6 gives us a little bit of an answer. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity, sin of us all, all humankind. So think about this. Think about who Jesus is. Jesus is God, and we learned that in John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were created. So Jesus is God. He is a part of God. Yet here he is, the Son of God, down here on this earth. So what this tells us is that Jesus was both human and God. 
But think about this. If Jesus is a part of God, God is holy. And a part of the holiness of God is the fact that he cannot be within the presence of sin. God cannot be anywhere near sin. He can't look on sin because he is so holy that physically he cannot be a part of that. But see, God wants nothing more than to spend eternity with us. And the only way that he can take our sin away from us is with a sacrifice. So that sin has to be justified. And blood is the atonement that is, the, that is needed. So because of our sin, we should instead die. But God loves us so much that he took our sin and he put it on to Jesus. All of our sin went on to Jesus so he could become the sacrifice that we desperately needed in the atonement for our penalty. So Jesus is taking on the sins of the world, of all mankind. And as a holy God, this would have been enough to kill him. Just the guilt of the sin within him would have been enough to kill Jesus. But there's another thing. With Jesus taking on the sin of the world, that takes him and separates him from God. Because God can't be in the presence of sin. Therefore, if Jesus takes on the sin and puts the sin on him, he has to be separated from God. You see, Jesus was filled with so much dread and sorrow, not just because he's about to suffer a brutal beating, die an excruciating death, and leave behind his disciples, even though I'm sure that figured in a little bit, but that he's also to take on the sin of mankind and be separated from his heavenly father. This would have been more than enough to make Jesus sorrowful. Jesus is distressed, and it shows us that he's both divine and human. Now, obviously, Jesus claimed to be God many times throughout his ministry. But the fact of being filled with sin and being separated from the Father gives him so much sorrow, shows his divinity. And the fact that Jesus is even sorrowful and that he is feeling pain shows that he is human. But see, this is so important from, from a theological standpoint, really, that Jesus has to be both man and human. See, if Jesus was just God while he was on earth then the, the temptation that he faced and the fact that he lived a perfect life really means nothing. But the fact that he was also human means so much too. You see, if Jesus were not fully divine while he was here on earth, there is no way he could have lived the perfect life and there's no way he could have taken on the wrath of God and survived. The sacrifice of Christ for the remission of all of mankind's sin only works if Jesus was both God and human. And the fact that he struggled mightily and the fact that he was so distressed within the garden attest to that fact. Jesus was so sorrowful to the point of sweating blood. So what does Jesus do when he is at this point where he is so just distressed to the point of death? What does he do? The second of the four actions that Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane was pray. Now see, and this is not just the passing, flippant prayer that Jesus gives. He takes time to walk all the way from the city, around the city, across the brook, all the way to the garden to pray. It probably took him a half hour or more to walk from the city to the garden. So Jesus, with this crazy night going on, takes time to stop and pray. Let's read in Matthew. He says, and going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not fall into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Jesus fell on his face and prayed. Three times he went to pray. Now these were just not simple prayers. These were not, lay, now lay me down to sleep, or God is great, God is good, thank you for this food. No, this is prayer with everything that Jesus had in his physical being. Now, I understand that the Lord's Prayer was Jesus teaching his disciples and us how to pray. 
You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, that teaches us how to pray through thanksgiving and how to pray for the daily essentials. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, this teaches us how to pray to ask for forgiveness. Please forgive us as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Yes, this is a great prayer. But the, the prayer that Jesus gives in the garden is such a great tool for us to pray through crisis. What do we do in moments of crisis? What do we do when life is hard as humans? We try to fix it. We try to run from the crisis. We try to fix the crisis. We ignore the crisis. We do everything in our power to outmaneuver the crisis, but that's not what Jesus did. You see, Jesus was more than capable of fixing this problem that was, that was going on. Jesus could have returned to heaven in the snap of a finger and been done with the whole thing. Jesus could have ran and been in Bethany by the time the, the guards came to arrest him. Jesus could have went to the high priest and recanted everything that he said. He said, I, I was off my medication. I was crazy. No, he, but instead, Jesus knew that he had to take on the cross and he had to take on the beating. So Jesus goes to the Father and he prays, listen, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this at all. And if there's any way for me not to do this, please, let's do that. But it's not my will, it's your will. See, this goes to teach us how much of a priority prayer is and how much of a priority prayer should be in our lives. You know, there's a lot going on and Jesus took time out to pray. Now that's also important because Jesus, like we said a second ago, is a part of God. Jesus is the son of God. I don't know how Jesus prayed. I don't know what the line of communication between Jesus and God was. You know, it was like he thought it in automatic, I don't know. But we see that Jesus, even being the son of God, even being a part of God, took time out of his day, took time out of his, the last 24 hours of life to go and pray. And not just pray flippantly or in passing, but to get down on his face and beg and plead with the father and to pray to him with everything he had. The creator of the universe took three hours out of this busy night to pray. He took, the time to spend, he t he took time to spend time in intimate conversation with God the Father. Now let's be honest, if Jesus needs to take time out of his day, out of this day, of any day, to spend time with God the Father in prayer, how much more do we need it? You know, see, as, as humans, we think we can handle it on our own. We think we got this. We got this. It's no problem. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of my kids. There's so many times where they're just like, no, I don't need your help. And Asher's the worst. Asher is, he's, he's the worst. He is the I can do this kid. You know, he, his shoes are always on the wrong feet because he won't let us put them on him. Um, his socks are always on backwards. Just this week, he went to the fridge. I'm standing in the kitchen. He went to the fridge and he got a go-gurt out. If you, don't know what a, if you don't know what a go-gurt is, you're not a parent of a young child. But a go-gurt is basically a yogurt tube that you can take with you on the go. Go-gurt. So he gets a go-gurt, and I stand there and I watch him, and he's fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. And he can't get it open. He's chewing at it. He's growling at it. And I'm like, you know, hey, buddy, do you want me to help you? Do you want me to open that for you? He says, no, I got it. And about the time he says that, he opened it all the way, all the way open. And go-gurt go just went everywhere. He struggled. He had to do it. He was going to take care of this himself. He had it. It was him. But that's how God sees us, I'm sure. I'm sure we're going through life and we're like, I've got this. This is no problem. I've got this. And God's like, are you serious? Just let me open the go-gurt for you. If, you. if you've spent any time with children in between the ages of two and four, you understand that. You probably understand, okay, that's how God is looking at me. We think we've got it under control, but God's just sitting there like, are you serious? Come on. So many times we wait until we were in the middle of our mess to pray. Uh, yes, same thing. Asher, he was ready for me to clean the gogurt up. He was ready for me to wipe the yogurt up off the floor. See, here's the thing. We have the power of an almighty God within us to help us. Yet so often we lean on our own selves instead of him. Jesus is the son of God, and while he was on earth, spent a huge time in prayer, and as mere humans, it is imperative for us to pray as absolutely as much as possible. But just as important as prayer is, the way that Jesus prayed is just as important. The third of the four actions of Jesus in the garden is submission. 
submission. Jesus prayed to the Father with a submissive attitude. Now, submission is not a word that we like to use today in our society and our culture at all. Submission is uncomfortable. Let me tell you, the only time we like to use the word submission is as husbands when we say wives are to submit to their husbands, right? That's the only time. Submit. Go on, submit, you know, even though that's obviously not what it means. That's not what Paul was talking about. That's another sermon. But submission is uncomfortable. Submission calls us to put down our pride, and that's the last thing we want to do. Submission is doing what God has called us to do. When we look at the prayer of Jesus and the sequences of prayers, we see that theme of submission throughout. Look, he says, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He went to Peter, so you could not watch with me one hour. Watch and pray that you may not enter temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. For again, he went a second time and he prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Your will be done. Now, it's obvious when reading these passages, Jesus did not want to do this. You know, Jesus did not offer up and say, yeah, this is something I want to do. I cannot wait to get beat to the point of death. I cannot wait to hang on the cross. It is going to be so much fun. No, 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 no. Jesus did not want to do this. It was obvious that he did not want to do this. Over and over again, God, please take this from me. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it, but not what I want, what you want. This is a great example of what the entire Christian life should be. The entire Christian life can be summed up in these words, not my will, but your will. You see, submission is the attitude that we must have in our daily lives to fully and truly follow Jesus. You know what the opposite of submission is? Sin. The opposite of submission is sin. Think about it. God said to Adam and Eve, do you see that tree over there? Don't eat from that tree. Eat any tree. That one tree, don't eat it. So now they have a choice. They, have, they can do one of two things. They can either fully submit to God and say, no, I'm not going near that tree. I'm not going to eat out of that tree. Or, or the other option is I'm not going to submit to what you want me to do. I'm going to go eat from this tree. And what do they do? They go eat from the tree and sin enters into the world. Plug that into any scenario. God says, don't look at a woman lustfully. So you have a decision. You can look at a woman lustfully and not submit to what God tells you to do. Or you can submit to what God tells you to do and not look at a woman lustfully. It goes on and on and on. God says not to lie. You can either submit and not lie or you could not submit to him and lie. Every single sin is the opposite of submission. Every single sin is the opposite of submission. You see, this is true just on a surface level of don't eat the fruit or don't look at a woman lustfully, but it also is true on a deeper level of God says, hey, I need you to do this. Just like when God said to Abraham, pick up your stuff and go, he could have said no. He could have not submitted to what God wanted him to do and that would have been sinful, but instead he submitted to what God and he went. You see, here's the deal. God has called us to a life of following him. And the only way we can do that is to submit to him and to his will. We must have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus that he had in the garden. We have to be fully submissive to God in his will at all times. Now, a part of that submissive attitude that Jesus had leads directly to this fourth action. And the fourth and final action of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane is surrender. Surrender, like submission, is not a word we like to use today. We see surrender as weakness. Surrender is what the losing army does. Surrender is for losers. If you lose, you surrender. We don't want anything to do with that. But surrendering is what Jesus did. Then they came up and they laid hands on him, on Jesus, and they seized him. And behold, one of those who were with him, with Jesus, stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and struck the servant of the high priest that cut off his ear. 
And Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in this temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left and fled. And those who had seized him led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders had gathered. So here we have Jesus in the garden with his disciples. He just went and prayed for a few hours desperately to his father that, oh, I don't want to do this, but I will. And then here comes the band of men, and Jesus just walks right up to him. I love him telling his disciples that he could call on legions of angels. He says, 12 legions of angels. He says, I could call down 70,000 angels to take out these people. But I got this. This is what I have to do. I have to surrender my life into the hands of these evil men so that you can live. You see, Jesus waves the white flag here and he tells the men, I give up. I give up. You win this battle. See, because Jesus knew what the real war was. And he knew that the next battle was going to be. He knew that was going to be the battle in the grave. And he knew that battle that he was going to win. And he knew by winning the battle in the grave that he would win the war over evil and in turn save all of humanity. So what does Christ's surrender have to do with us on a daily basis? Everything. First and foremost, his surrender shows us his great love for us. You see, this was the last opportunity Jesus had to stop this, to stop this madness. This was the last time he could have stopped it. But his surrender says, no, I love you. Jesus calls us to surrender. Not only does this surrender show us his love, but it shows us how we should act and how the only way for us to truly follow him is to surrender. Luke 9 says this, then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And he strictly charged the command of them to tell this to no one. He said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and to be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to them, if any would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his soul? You see, this is a perfect passage to show us what true surrender looks like. See, Jesus is the son of man, the son of God. And first of all, the first part of this passage, he says, I must suffer and die. He is saying, first, I have to come and I have to surrender and I have to be killed. This is what surrender looks like. For me to truly live, for you to truly live, I must die. But that's, not where, but that's not the end of it. See, Jesus says that we have to lose our lives too. This scene in the garden with Jesus surrendering to the authorities is showing us how to live our lives. You see, the four main actions of Jesus in the garden were that he was distressed, he prayed, he had submission, and he surrendered. Now, surrender as it applies to us right now in this moment. This is what we want to end our time focusing on is surrender because all of this really leads to Jesus surrendering so what does surrender mean to us right now now there are many different levels or degrees of surrender different stages of life that re require different types of surrender there are different scenarios that require different types of surrender. But each and every one of us this morning that are here, 
need to surrender something. Maybe you're here this morning and you're actively following Jesus the best you can. But there's just this one worry within you that's keeping you from fully following him. You need to take that worry and surrender that to God. Maybe you're doing your best to follow Jesus and you're doing your best to follow him, but there's just this one sin that's holding you back from fully following him. There's just this one sin that's in your way. You need to take that and surrender that to God today. Maybe you're here this morning and your marriage is struggling. Maybe you and your spouse are both living in isolation of each other. Well, this morning you need to come and surrender your marriage to God. Maybe you're here this morning and your children are just in a mess. And you can't figure out what's going on with them. You don't know what to do. You need to surrender to God. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your ego or your pride that needs to be surrendered to God. See, here's the deal. Whatever it is, God is bigger. And whatever it is, God wants you to take what is in between you and him to take it away and to give it to him, to surrender it to him. Because you cannot fully come to God and you cannot fully follow him if there's something in between the two of you. Maybe you're here this morning and you have never named Jesus Christ as your savior. Maybe you're here this morning and you have never said, yes, Jesus, my heart belongs to you. Maybe you've been coming to church for a while and you believe, you're starting to think, okay, yeah, maybe that's, maybe, yeah, okay, maybe this is true. But you've never publicly confessed your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been coming to church and you believe for a while, but you've never been baptized. If that's you, you need to surrender to God as soon as possible. Tomorrow is is not promised. So you need to come and surrender your entire life to God and tell him, you are my savior. I'm gonna live for you from here on out. If there's something that you desperately, desperately need to get rid of in your life, you need to surrender it to God. Do it before you leave here today. Take some time to sit and pray and tell God, hey, I don't want this anymore. I want you to take it from me. If you want to come up after church, I'll be up front. I'll gladly pray for you and I'll gladly talk to you. The war is over. God's already won the war. We may still be fighting battles here on earth, but God has already won the war. He's done all the work. We don't need to work anymore. All we have to do is surrender to him, and it's time for us to come to him and surrender. Let's pray, and then we'll dismiss. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son. We thank you so much for Jesus coming down to this earth from the realms of heaven just to die. For him to come and surrender his life to be brutally killed. We're thankful that he took on the sin of the world, that he took our sin, that he took my sin so I could be justified to you. Be with us now, God, as we all know, every single one of us in this room, we all know that there's something that we need to surrender. It may be huge, it may be small, but anything that is in between us in between us and you, anything that is there needs to be surrendered to you. And dear God, I pray that you just touch everyone's heart and say, this is what you need, give this to me. And if anyone's here who does not know you personally, God, please put on their heart right now that they need to come to know you and they need to name you as their savior. And dear God, please be with us now as we leave this place. Let, we, let us leave this place as beacons of light to you. And then we will be a bright light in this ever-dimming world. And it's in your son's name we pray, amen.
If you guys are in need of prayer, anybody wants to come on the talk, I'll be up here afterwards. And if not, we'll go to second hour. Thank you all. God bless.